Welcome back to the podcast. This is part two of the series on raising pigs on the homestead with pork rind. I hope you enjoyed the first part because this part gets even better. Welcome to the Homesteading for Beginners podcast, your go-to resource for starting and maintaining a thriving homestead. I'm Mona Weathers, your homesteading mentor and coach. Together, we'll explore the world of homesteading with the right mindset, ensuring a healthy and fulfilling journey for you, your family, and your community. Join me as I share stories from my own 20 plus year journey. We also have expert guests joining us on the show, bringing their unique insights and experiences to help you on your homesteading path. Let's grow together and create the homestead of your dreams. Before we move on to um, someone actually wanting to you to have a business out of raising pork, will you like walk through just like maybe the top three breeds for for a scenario of a person that we just talked about that does need that much pork, you know, like someone who's who's on the smaller scale, like just wants a few pigs. What like maybe the top three breeds for for someone like that? Uh, okay, I'm gonna give more more details that <laughs> that want it for uh, meat and that want it quickly. The shortest amount of time possible for the most meat, basically. Okay, cool. Um, good question. So there are four categories that I'll look at when I look at pig breeds. Uh, you have uh, primary suspect number one, your conventional or commercialized breeds. These are breeds that have been quote unquote perfected by the industry, the swine industry. And I mean, Billions of dollars has been sucking into pig genetics in the swine industry. And so they have been highly fine-tuned to um, give particular outcomes, specific outcomes, when it comes to carcass size and growth weight. Uh, other breed categories would consist of your lard breeds. Um, so you have your big lard breeds, like your Maishans, English Arch Blacks. Um, even mule foots, you have your smaller lard breeds, um, like your American Guinea hogs and your Oswald Island hogs, even Cooney Coonies. And you have your wild breed, which is the Eurasian wild boar, um, or all these boar hybrids out in Texas and the lower Southeast that are just destroying the, the country, um, and agriculture there. Uh, and then you have like your, your heritage meat quality uh, pigs. So let's say you're just wanting quick pork. You're not even thinking about rotating on pasture. Just screw that. that that's not important to you. You'd rather do deep bedded system. And I actually recommend this for, for what I'm about to say. Then I recommend using a conventional pig. We are not talking about breeding. Make that very clear. We're not talking about breeding animals. We're breeding pigs. We're simply talking about I'm buying a pig or two pigs. I always go buy two. Um, I'm buying two pigs for the purpose of meat consumption. I'm not holding any of them for breeding. I'm strictly eating them. Uh, so if that's the case, then Yorkshire, um, Hampshire, let's see, some types of land race, and I feel like I'm missing one. Yorkshire, Hampshire, Duroc. That's what I was thinking about, Duroc. Those would be really quick. They're ready to go in six months. They'll reach about around, usually a little over sometimes, depending on how you feed them, 250 pounds uh, live weight. Uh, usually by the time that you start breaking down the pig into carcasses and then carcasses into retail cuts, you usually get about 57% utilization from that whole pig. Um, so you can kind of average that whatever the weight of the pig is alive, um, 57 percent of that is going to be what you're going to get back in terms of usable pork products. Now, if you like keeping your lard and the bones, you'll get more back from that. Um, so it'll be a higher percentage. So if you're just wanting quick meat, you want done easy, uh, I highly recommend using those breeds. And then my recommendation is to use a deep bedded system. Um, these pigs are, are bred for concrete floors. Um, so having them out on pasture might not be the best. Also, if you have any pink pigs, they're more prone to sunburning. So you don't want them to get a lot of exposure to the sun. Again, these pigs were bred for indoor environments. 
So they can still have some outdoor access, but having a deep bedded system, which is outdoors, um, you know, you have either concrete sides or what some people do and what I recommend, um, you have a cattle panel, not hog panel, but cattle panel. You create a perimeter of cattle panel. Make sure the, the area you're doing it on is flat. Um, and then you just add in your junk straw and your wood chips and use uh, IMO. Uh, it's like a Korean natural farming thing. It stands for indigenous microorganisms. You can create your own IMO at home. You can also buy IMO cultures online. Uh, I think some of them are even on Amazon if you still like Jeff Bezos. Um, so, you know, that's an option for you too. The IMO will help with um, a breaking down manure, breaking down urine. It also will help uh, reduce the amount of flies uh, because again, flies are just an indicator that something's not being broken down. And so the flies response is to um, decompose it by feeding off of it and laying their eggs. But if there's already microorganisms doing that more effectively, you normally are not going to see flies be an issue. So that's another option. Um, I'd recommend doing that. Wood chips, junk hay, conventional breeds, cattle panel for siding. Make sure that that siding is tight and that's not going to break. And then you just keep adding more carbon material as the pigs get older and as they start adding more manure. After that's done, you kill the pigs, you take off the cattle panel, and now all that manure, you turn it, you put in a compost area, you keep turning it, and then within nine months, that's usable compost um, in a regular temperate environment. So that's, that's if you want quick pork, easy pork, simple pork. What you don't get out of that is you don't necessarily get a lot of fat. Number one, you can overcompensate that by growing them out for a little bit longer. Um, generally, those breeds eat at least five pounds of feed a day on average. Um, when they're younger, clearly they're not going to eat that much. But when they get older, they can eat up to seven, even to eight pounds of feed a day growing. So they are more feed intensive and they're bred to be that way. Um, so again, Yorkshires, Durocs, Hampshires, uh, more commercialized breeds, they can grow and thrive in that system. Um, in terms of like forage, what you can do is give them day old grocery waste, um, produce waste, Nowadays, we have organic produce, so you can feed them that. Just go to your local grocery store and say, hey, I'm a farmer. Uh, I noticed that we have a, a food waste crisis, and I just want to help partner with you um, to be able to help mitigate that risk. Uh, and if you have that kind of approach to a grocery store, talk to the produce manager. If he says no, she says no, talk to the store manager. Maybe they might say yes. If they say no, talk to the district manor, manager. That's a give and take, but usually they'll say yes to that. And then you can get organic produce um, that you can feed your pigs as a form of forage. Uh, so that's one way of getting around not having a regenerative system, yet having regenerative practices. Um, and let's say you want to do pigs on pasture and you still won't make meat quickly. Um, you can still use the commercial breeds. They just won't do as well. And they're going to eat a whole lot more feed, grain feed. Um, if you use breeds that are meat breeds, meat heritage breeds like Tamworths, red wattles, not waddles, wattles, two T's, um, Gloucestershire Old Spot, or you can just type in G-O-S pig. And I'm always missing one breed. Oh, and Berkshire uh, and Herefords. Those breeds can do pretty well on pasture. Just make sure you're getting them from a, a farmer who is raising them on pasture or in outdoor systems. Again, pigs are not pasture animals. They can be on pasture, but that's not their original design. Um, so make sure that you're having shade structures of some sort to keep them cool, wallows, um, giving them access to the woods as well. But most of those breeds can reach 250 pounds within eight months. And you can grow them out for another 10 months, or not another 10 months, up to 10 months. And usually by that point, they'll be closer to 300 pounds. The reason why you want to grow them out to 300, which is my recommendation, is because, A, they get a little bit more fat. So for people who need lard um, for maybe home consumption for food, maybe you have a skincare, home skincare business, and you need as much lard, like natural raised lard as possible, um, grow them out to 300 pounds. It's more bang for your butt. You do get more meat, 
but you're going to get a little bit more lard depending on what you're feeding them. Um, if you're raising pigs, no matter what they are, um, understand that feed is important. They need a carb source in their feed. They need a protein source in their feed. They need a fiber source and a mineral source in their feed. Uh, if you're new to raising pigs, I do not recommend feeding your pig just junk waste because you have no concept of nutrition. Uh, and so what I recommend first is grow them out on regular feed and allow for them to thrive off of that. With all meat breeds, they need to be given as much feed as they want. Don't ration out feed to them. They don't need a ration out feed. Only lard breeds need rationed feed because they're prone to obesity. Meat breeds need as much feed as they possibly can get. That way they can actually grow out on time. If you limit the amount of feed that those pigs get, they're going to grow slower. So you can feed them less. Just understand that it might take longer for them to reach the same weight that they could reach earlier if they had more feed in their diet. Uh, that's a lot of information. So if you're listening to this, please feel free to rewind, listen to about five more times, um, but hopefully that should help. Yeah, definitely. I, that was great information. And I did want to touch on, I, I mentioned that this was more of a large scale homestead uh, animal. And I'm, when I talk about small scale, I mean like someone who less than an acre, um, but you said earlier that there's some breeds that you could have on an acre would the first group of group be the ones that you would have on an acre of land? So they're the first ones that you can have on an acre of land if you are using a deep bedded system. Um, usually conventional commercial pigs, they are so prone to land management destruction. And it's really not their fault. It's the farmer's fault. Um, and what that requires if you have Yorkshire's Hampshire's and Durots on pasture or in the woods, you have to rotate them a lot quicker than you would a heritage breed usually, um, especially the smaller heritage breeds. They're just more prone to digging up stuff. They're more active, they're more muscular, so they have more power to dig through things. Um, and so that, that makes them a little bit harder to manage for a newbie. If you're doing rotational grazing systems, you don't have to do rotational grazing systems if you have a deep bedded system, which is stationary, um, you're giving them all the food, you're giving them all the water, it's in one place. And then at the end of their life, which is usually around six, to eight months, you use all that compost and you turn it, flip it. And then by six months say, to nine months, usually nine months, um, you can use it in your gardens or spread it back onto your fields. Um, if you have herbivores that need more, um, more nutrient on the fields that they're going to be eating off of in the future. Okay, awesome. That's such great information. I'm, I'm learning a lot, like I always do when I talk to you. <laughs> um, so I like to give people the pros and the cons. And we've and, and most of what we talked about was the pros of owning pigs. I mean, you talked about a little bit about the cons. But so my, my next question is, what is the biggest struggle with having pigs? What is the biggest con <laughs> uh, of having uh, pigs? So the biggest con of having pigs is um, there's no in-between with them. Like chickens, you can be in-between with chickens. Uh, but with pigs, they're kind of like goats. I've raised, used to manage a whole herd of goats. Um, they're either you love them or you hate them. So there's nothing in between. If you're not enthusiastic about pigs after raising them for a couple of months, give them back to their original owner or sell them off. Um, and, and don't do it immediately. Just stick with it for a year or however long that you're going to be raising them out for. Um, but generally, if you're not enthusiastic about them, don't keep them. Uh, part of what, from my own experience, that made pigs unexciting for me was user error. And so if you're having problems with pigs, nine times out of 10, it's probably your fault. Uh, I say that with a lot of love and grace and experience because it was always my fault when uh, pigs were being just ornery and mischievous. I wasn't doing something right. In permaculture, the, the principle of the biggest principle is observation. There is no permaculture without observational skills. Uh, and so one thing that I tell people is 
develop your farmer eye. So it's not for pigs, it's not just feed, water, and shelter. It's the context in between all of that and everything else around it, right? Um, so like, okay, why aren't my pigs eating? Is there something I'm not giving them? Or why my pigs keep breaking out? Is it something that they don't have in the area that I've given them and they're trying to go find it elsewhere? So make sure that if you're having problems with pigs, that it's not your fault first. Usually it's going to be your fault first. It might be nutritional deficiencies. It might be you need to give them more space. It might be they're just simply bored. Um, pigs are highly intelligent creatures. So they have the IQ of about a five-year-old, somewhere around there. Uh, so imagine a five-year-old that's bored. Some of you have five-year-olds. If your five-year-old was bored, you would have a destroyed house, right? Uh, so pigs can do the exact same thing, which is why rotating them helps them not be as bored. Having a deep bedded system where they have enough uh, carbon material that they can dig through and lift up and play around in um, helps them not be bored. So whatever you can do to help the pig not get bored, whether it's changing the feed, adding variety to the feed every now and then, giving them treats, um, rotating them, um, giving them belly scratches and, and, and rubs, stuff like that. That will help the pig not only become more tamed and like you more, but also help a lot of the behavioral issues that a lot of pig farmers experience when they're starting their journey into raising pigs. So I think the biggest con is user error and um, you either love them or you hate them. But if you can get past those two things, oh, pigs are great. They are one of the best farm tools you can ever have. Um, they're not, they don't have the same limitations that a lot of herbivores would have. Um, you know, so with herbivores, you need grass. You always need grass. Pigs, just like chickens, since they're monogastric, one stomach animals, they don't need grass necessarily. Um, and that's the beauty of them compared to if you have a drought, you're screwed with cows, with sheep, with goats, if you're depending on grass. And now you have to buy hay. Hay is very expensive. Um, my horse people know exactly what I'm talking about. So. <laughs> Yes. And we we won't get into the horse conversation because actually uh, Jill Winger and I are going to be talking about that because we both are horse people. But yes, horses don't contribute anything. They are a money suck. But there are certain people like me, a breed of people that just can't live without them. So <laughs> we won't talk about that. But that's good to know. That's really good information as far as like I never really categorized that the pig wasn't an herbivore even though I knew it wasn't but I just kind of lumped them into you know livestock and um yeah that is that is so true because hay is expensive uh when you have to purchase it <laughs> which I do um so let's move on now to the someone who wants to do uh, pig farming as a business. Um, let's give the scenario that they have 10 acres. <laughs> um, they are really wanting to do it as an income source um, for their community, their local community. Is there some advice you would give them, someone getting started with something like that? Yeah. Um... That's, yeah, there's a lot of advice I can give for that. Uh, someone who's been there, done that. Um, I think the biggest thing is, A, asking yourself, do you want to do it? So let's say you don't get in the business until you've raised pigs for at least two years and you're comfortable and confident with, with that skill, right? After two years, you know whether or not you like pigs or not. And from there, um, you have enough adequate skill to where you can scale up. Uh, raising 10 pigs really is no different than raising 30. Raising 30 pigs really is no different than raising 50 pigs. Raising 50 really is no different than raising 100. The only difference is uh, economy of scale and uh, cash flow. So uh, and we can talk about that in a little bit. So the biggest thing is, A, seeing whether or not you like pigs. B, research, right? So I have a, uh, for my business brand, we have a framework. And first thing we talk about is, what's your niche? What's your personal niche? What do you get at? Are you good at raising pigs? Cool. Then maybe this might be an option for you. Uh, next step is to research everything, right? So research, not just pig breeds and all that stuff. That's fun. Um, but also be researching nutrition. What, what kind of nutrition 
do I need to be feeding my pigs? Maybe when it was just you, you kind of got by with feeding scraps. You're not going to be able to get by with feeding scraps if you're raising pigs at scale, right? And let's say, oh, well, I could just buy bakery waste and all this other stuff. Well, now you're having a lot of different feed values happening and you're not necessarily a feed nutritionist and you haven't raised pigs long enough to know what good quality pork can turn out um, by combining different feeds. So if you mess up, well, guess what? That's going to look bad on you. It's one thing if you mess up on your own pig. Perfect. No one has to know about that. But if you're selling a quality product that people are going to look at and see the quality of it, it better look good. So instead of fudging around and, and trying to be cheap, you're going to have to start buying out grain, usually initially. Um, and that's an expense that you have to budget into. So, you know, research. Another thing that you need to be researching is your market. Does the market that you that you want to sell into even care about your product? I can't. Ugh. All right. Quick rant. I know I ain't got a lot of time. I'll do a very, very concise, quick rant. When um, I have a homesteader or let's say a new beginning farmer, uh, they come to me and they're like, hey, pork rind, we we were not able to push this product. Uh, we, we keep pushing it, but we're not getting um, good results, good sales from it. And so I said, OK, you know, I, I think I might be able to, able to help because they, they think it's a marketing issue. If they just fix the marketing, it'd be fine. I said, OK, but let, let's talk real quick. I got two questions for you. If you can, if you, if that's if you pass question number one. Question number one, did you ever ask if anyone needed your product? Did you do any surveys? Did you go to community meetings? Did you ask friends and family? Did you ask anyone if they were able to, if they were willing to buy your product, if they even needed it? About 95% of those farmers who come to me, the answer to that question is no. So now I got 5% who said they did do that. All right, cool. So out of that 5%, I said, all right, I got question number two for you. Did you ever ask if they would buy it at the price point that would be profitable for you? And out of that 5%, about 98 of them say no, right? So it, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty sad when a lot of people start a business because they think and assume that people are just going to buy their product, when in reality, they never did the work to see whether or not people were even interested. So these are the same people who go to a farmer's market. They'll, they'll get huffed and puffed up because people are, are looking by and looking past them and scoffing at their prices. And they'll get resentful towards customers or potential customers who aren't buying their product. And what I have to say to them with a lot of love and a lot of grace is, no, actually, you're in the wrong. Right now, you're being entitled. You're being entitled to their money. You didn't even ask them if they wanted your product. So how are you expecting them to buy from you? That's entitlement right there. And you got to get that checked out. But don't you worry. You came to the right person. We're going to fix you. We're going to make you, we're going we're to make it happen for you. And we're going to get you on the right track. So, you know, it, ask yourself, do the people around you even care enough to buy your product? And if they did, would they even pay the prices that it costs for you to be profitable? What is what is price? Price is not production costs. If that's what you think price is, you've already lost money. Price is production cost plus overhead uh, plus profit margin, right? So you're creating a price. You need to include a profit margin in there. Some people use a dollar amount per product. Some people use a percentage. Whatever works best for you, doesn't matter. Um, but you need to incorporate that. For a lot of people who are small scale, they realize that if they actually price their product at, at not just the cost, but plus a profit margin, that it'll be extraordinarily expensive. Part of the reason why is because they have low economy of scale. They have inefficient economy of scale because they're too small. So they're not getting um, benefits from bulk buying, buying bulk grain, buying bulk equipment. Um, they're also not able to enter into more secure markets, like let's say restaurants, grocery stores, co-ops, where they'll make orders every week or every month. So you have a little bit more guarantee Whereas in a farmer's market, you got no guarantee. If it rains, no one's showing up, right? But you still have to show up. So then the opportunity cost for you to be there, which is, all right, I woke up, I spent an hour packing, I spent an hour driving, I spent 
uh, 30 minutes unloading and setting up my stand. I spent five hours at the market, uh, packed everything up, drove an hour back home, and then put back everything that I had left, right? So that's, that's basically the whole day. So if you were actually tracking your labor costs, because you are, you are a part of the labor costs, always keep track of your labor, then you end up realizing, oh, wait, I spent $100, $200, $300 showing up to a place where I only made 50 bucks. You were better staying at home, building your online website, building an online brand, than actually going to a farmer's market where people weren't even going to buy your product. Mm -hmm. So the, this is so good. I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but this is so good because the market research, I feel like so many people don't do any of that. And I, I've had, you know, small businesses in the past and I didn't either until, you know, I realized that was the big mistake. Um, find out if somebody's even interested in the product that you want, but uh, make sure you're taking notes. I'm sure this is, this information is, is, like blowing your mind and make sure you're taking notes. Um, so that information was super helpful and useful. And you, I'm sure you could talk about this for hours. In fact, you do talk about this a lot in speaking engagements. Are there any speaking engagements that are coming up that, that someone can know about? Yeah. So um, I will be, let's see. Next couple coming up will be God's Good Table. That'll actually be at Polyface in August. Uh, after that, I'll have uh, Indiana Homesteaders Conference. That will be, I believe, in October. Maybe September, probably October. It's in October. Pretty sure it's October. And then um, Homesteaders of America, which is also in October. Uh, I might go up to Alaska and speak at an event that's still to be announced. Um, It'll be in November, so it's going to be just cold, cold, dark and cold. Um, but uh, if, if I do go, that'll be my, my first time there in Alaska. So looking forward to, to chatting with those. And um, that'll be a Farm Bureau conference, so it won't be homesteading related. Okay, awesome. Um, are, are there anything, is, like how would someone get into your world? What's the best way for someone to get into your world and to find out more information about what the things you offer and maybe explain some of the things that you offer as well? Yeah. So I think for this community, um, you can definitely check out um, Agro Educators. Uh, that's my business brand. Pork Run is my personal brand. Um, I've created the business brand and have a team of people where we, we just simply help farmers and people who want to get into full-time farming, as well as people who just want to be what we call agropreneurs. They don't necessarily want to farm, but they want to use products that are from small farmers to make cool different new products and services. Um, so we, you can find us at agro, A-G-R-O, educators with an S, um, dot com. You can also find us on YouTube if you like watching YouTube content at agro, A-G-R-O, um, educators with an S. And also look up pork rind. You'll find me just by looking up pork rind. Um, so that'll be one way that you could reach out. And we got plenty of content coming out. Um, many of our consultation videos will also be on YouTube. So if you're like, ah, I think I want to be do consultation for my homestead or for, you know, scaling up my business, but I don't know what that looks like. I'm kind of scared to invest that money into that. Just watch our consultation videos. I think most of them, you won't even need a consultation after you watch the video. It should give you enough insights where you can go on and win at life. Um, so that'll be a free resource to everybody. And then on agroeducators, if that, if you need more help outside of what we provide for free, um, we can also hook you up with consultation as well. And, uh, we do, uh, free weekly consultations, uh, one a week. So if you want to sign up for that, that'll be at agroeducators. Um, and we try to do that for people who can't afford it. Um, so you get to be on the waiting list for that. So other than that, that's it. That's amazing that you offer that. I just, the, one of the things that's really great about the homesteading community, I feel like, is we're, we are very community oriented and we understand that we need each other to make the movement be a really good experience for everyone. So 
I love that you offer that, that, that free consultation as well and have all that, the uh, YouTube videos and things like that. So, okay, well, that is all. And I just want to thank you so much for coming. I miss our clubhouse conversations. <laughs> so this was really good. This was brought back some memories of the OG clubhouse. <laughs> well, I appreciate you inviting me and, um, Thank you for not only holding space for me, but for all these homesteaders who they, this is their dream, um, you know, and it's very complicated to figure out how do I get to even be a homesteader, let alone ra forget raising pigs, just how do I get land? You know, how, if I do have land, how do I make it useful? Um, so I appreciate you not only holding space, but inviting experts and guests to help your community because this community Needs a lot of help. I, I agree. I feel like that there was just this surge in popularity and then a lot of people struggling suddenly. I feel like that's what ended up happening, is, which is why I, I decided to speak directly to beginners, dreamers and beginners. And so, yeah. Well, thank you again. And we will talk again soon. Cool. Have a good one. You can get all of Pork Rind's information in the show notes. Um, he mentioned some of the links. I have those in the show notes as well. Um, remember, he, uh, Pork Rind will be one of the speakers, one of the teachers in the Homestead Income Plan group, if all goes well. We have, he has agreed to it. Uh, we just haven't scheduled it yet. So join the Homestead Income Plan Facebook group. And if you are one of those people that it does not like social media and does not like Facebook, I do have plans to make a VIP group as well. So stay tuned for that. I will make sure that I announce that when that comes, but that will be a, di a separate group off of social media platforms. It'll be one that I'll be hosting through my own um, platforms. So just to keep that in mind, okay, as always, have a wonderful day.